All right, if you've got a Bible, let's open them up to the book of Ephesians. Book of Ephesians, chapter 4. I want to give some uh, biblical foundation for what I'm going to talk about today. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Ephesians, chapter 4. I don't think we're going to have them on the screen, so just hang with me if you, if you don't have a Bible. I'm going to read this. Verse 11. Scripture speaking to us pastors, it says, and he gave some to be apostles and some to be prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers. We've been gifted with these giftings, this uh, gift of, a, uh, of evangelism, of shepherding, of teaching, of preaching. And then the scripture says why we have been given these giftings by the Spirit. It says, for the equipping of the saints... For the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, why have you been gifted the way that you've been gifted? The scripture is clear that God gifted you with that gift so that you would equip the people of God to do the work of the ministry of God. That's why you got the gift. And then in verse 16 it says this, and we've been talking a lot about how the church in America is declining. So let's just let's pay attention to this verse because it speaks to it. Uh, Ephesians 4.16. It says, From whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it's equipped. Now watch this. It says, When each part is working properly, makes the body grow. So that it builds itself up in love. When, when did... The scriptures say that the body is going to grow. When did the scriptures say that the body is going to be healthy and is going to be working properly and building itself up in love? It says when each part is working properly. All right? Um, there are a couple of things that began my wrestling with the current American attractional model of church. Right, I'm, I'm wrestling with it right now as a guy who, who pastors and leads an attractional model of church, of a, of a larger church. I just want to confess to you, I'm wrestling with it and I'm struggling with it. Honestly, I'm not just saying this, honestly, the, the concept of, of how we're doing church keeps me awake at night. And I want to share with you why I'm wrestling with it and what we're doing about it and then we're going to be done today. Um, First of all, I'm not one of these guys, and I want you to hear this clearly, I'm not one of these guys that thinks we ought to just blow up and run away from the attractional, uh, attractional model of church in this country. I, I'm not there yet. I don't think we just need to do away with it. Um, one is I think there's still people in this country that the attractional model of church is going to reach that maybe a smaller model or cell-based model may not reach yet. I'm just convinced of that at this point. Um, a good friend of mine is uh, Rick Barnes, the head coach of University of Texas basketball team. Coach Barnes came and, and sat in our services for three years, sitting under the word of God, letting the word of God touch and soften his heart before we could ever drag him into a smaller environment. And, and you ask him, you say, Coach, would you have come to a, a home church initially? And he would have said, man, there's no way. And so I think, I, think, I don't know that it's always going to be that way, but I'm just saying there's people in this country that the attractional model is still reaching. Now, having said that, again, coming from a guy who is pastoring a church like this, having said that, I am convinced that the current attractional model of church alone is incomplete. It's incomplete. Alone, it's incomplete. And it is not the answer. The current attractional American model of church alone is incomplete. And it's not the answer to turning the tide of, of churchlessness in America that we're seeing and seeing happen in a statistically significant way. And there are a couple of things that made me kind of come to this conclusion. The first was the book uh, Transformation by Bob Roberts. It's in the Exponential series. If you hadn't re read it, you should. And he made a, a point in this book that just floored me. He was asking the question, he said, what if in an attempt to reach America for Christ, we designed a strategy that was this, that we're going to start a thousand megachurches in the next ten years. He said, if, if we wanted to reach the nation for Jesus 
We could do it, right, by starting a thousand megachurches in 10 years. Think about that. Just 50 states, a thousand megachurches. We could reach the nation for Christ, right? Well, the answer is no, we couldn't. If that were our strategy, and we know that we would not reach the nation for Christ by starting a thousand megachurches because that's exactly what we just did over the last 10 years. I think there's 1,200 megachurches that have been started in the last 10 years and there are less people going to church today per capita in this country than 10 years ago. And so I'm reading this and, and as a guy who had just started one of those 1,200, that got my attention. Because whether or not we will admit it or not, and, and some of y'all are maybe just godlier than most pastors, but I think a lot of us would have a hard time admitting that. But I think many of us as church planners and pastors, that's just kind of the goal we're kind of going for. That's been the bar. That's been the, the goal that we're like, yeah, I mean, success for us is to have a lot of people that are coming to hear us preach and coming to our church. And then it just hit me, guys, like a ton of bricks. That's great, and that's good, and God is using that, but it is not working at penetrating the lostness of this country. It's not working. And the second thing that really began me questioning the effectiveness of the attractional model alone was a growing sense of restlessness that I am seeing in the laity of the American church. I've been seeing it for as long as I've been in Austin. There's a growing sense of restlessness in the laity of the American church today. You see, my parents went to church in East Texas, First Baptist Athens, every single Sunday of my life. We went to church. Uh, they tithed. They served in the nursery once a month. Uh, every once in a while, my dad would pass the uh, offering plate. He would pray sometimes in the services once a year on Deacon uh, Sunday. And then my dad would read the Bible a few times a week. And guys, that was it. That was the extent of their Christianity, and I think that they would have probably defined themselves as great Christians, uh, and, and, and in a lot of ways they are, but here's the thing, in their minds, in their minds, there were people that did the ministry, there were people that did ministry, that was the professional Christians, the pastors and, and the clergy and the evangelists and the music guys and the foreign mission, missionaries. Those were the people that did the ministry. And, and, and then there was the people that sat in the pews and got fed by the people that did the ministry. That was the way they viewed church. That, was still the, that is still the way that a lot of people today view church. And, and one of the things that I want to share with you guys today... Um, is the fact that this generation, and I believe this with all my heart, this generation that is growing up in the church today, 18 to 30 year olds, I just want you to know that they're not wired like my parents' generation. If you haven't clued into that, you need to clue into that. I know this, I've got a church that's absolutely full of 18 to 30 year olds. They are not, if they're Christians, Typically, if they're walking with Jesus, they are not okay with sitting on the sidelines of ministry. They are not content with passing your offering plates and handing out your bulletins and listening to your sermons and going about their lives. 18 to 30 year olds desire to be challenged. They are hardwired to want to be a part of something bigger than themselves And I believe with all my heart that the reason that 18 to 30 year olds are hemorrhaging from the church is because most of us haven't figured that out yet. Most of us haven't figured out that these people are not cool with sitting on the sidelines and watching the professional Christians. For far too long, for far too long, churches of every shape and size and color, um, our goal was what? It's, our goal was come to us. We're going to build a building for you, come to us, and we're going to feed you spiritually. Come to us, and we're going to provide programs for you and your kids to meet your needs. Come to us, and we're going to make you comfortable with church. And guys, I want you to know that there's nothing wrong with any of that. That stuff is awesome, and it's great, but the problem is, is for far too many folks and churches, that's where it's ended that's where it stopped. 
And for generations now, we have placed the onus and the responsibility of mission on paid clergy and foreign missionaries. Now listen to this. All the while that, that is happening here in our country, all the while there is a growing tension in the everyday person sitting in the pews, reading their Bibles, wondering deep down inside, why is the Christianity that I see lived out in the book of Acts so radically different than the Christianity at my church? And they're starting to wonder out loud. When do I get to get in the fight? They're starting to wonder. I'm hearing them. They're starting to wonder out loud. When do I get to be used by God with the Holy Spirit that He gave me at my salvation? And I always start thinking as a church staff and leadership and me personally I just we I like we got to figure out this we got to figure out a way to empower these people and to give them a shot to play a meaningful role in the kingdom of God all right <clears throat> lastly here on what kind of made me come to this realization of how the attractional model alone is not going to penetrate the lostness of our country was a huge aha moment I had about church growth just a big light bulb came on about church growth. We're out of space at our main campus. Uh, we're doing the multi-site thing. We're at two campuses, about to go to three. We've got eight services. Um, we've built a permanent facility. We've done all that. And guys, we are at a crossroads at a church, as a church. We're at, we're at a crossroads. We can, we can just keep going down the, the multi-site path, which we probably will. Um, we could build a bigger building, right? We could, uh, we could raise $30 million of, of kingdom money and, and build a big fat building and, and, and pay all, you know, all the stuff that requires to run that building. But for what? But for what? If, if we do that, if we spend all that money and hire all those staff to build a bigger building, then... It hit me that maybe, maybe 3,000 more people come to the Austin Stone. We can spend all that money and all that effort and all those people for what? Maybe three or four more thousand people come to the Austin Stone. And, and here's the thing that's messing me up and I realized is that if we at the Austin Stone grow another 3,000 people, if another 3,000 people come into our doors, then not much changes in the city of Austin. Did y'all catch that? I mean, that's great. We want those people to come. I care about those 3,000 people. I just want you to know that if 3,000 more people come into my doors, not much changes in the city of Austin. There's 1.3 million people that live in the greater Austin area. But what we began to think about is what if, instead of trying to spend all this money and do all this stuff to try to get another 3,000 people to come to our church, what if we called 3,000 people to leave our church? I mean, we're just being kind of crazy here, I know. We started dreaming like that. We started thinking, what if 3,000 of the people that are already coming to our church, what if we train them, equip them, and released them into, into, the, into the city, into the neighborhoods, into the university, into the bars, and the homes of Austin? I'm telling you, 3,000 more people come to the stone, very little changes. 3,000 people get released from the stone into the city, the whole city could change. I'm telling you, and you're, and you're like, you don't believe that? If you're like, I, I don't know, man, if that could really happen. I mean, for crying out loud, what was Jesus' ministry model? What was Jesus' church growth strategy? Was it, I'm going to preach really, really well and draw a big crowd and build a building and start some programs for the kiddos? Was that his church growth strategy? I mean, gosh, this guy, Jesus, at, at, uh, at the height of his popularity, when thousands of people were following him, it's like the, the American megachurch pastor's dream, man. Everybody was following Jesus. He was feeding them, and he was healing them, and he'd preach, and, and then they'd follow him around to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And at the, listen, at the height of his popularity, Jesus looked at the crowd and said the most controversial thing of his entire ministry. 
He looked at the crowd, the thousands, and he said, hey, you guys are following me because I'm feeding you and because I'm healing you. He said, unless you uh, eat my flesh, unless you drink my blood, you can have no part of me. And y'all remember what happened? Everybody just took off. And the, and the 12 disciples are sitting there with their eyes wide open going, dude, why did you just do that? And then he looks at the 12 and says, you going to leave me too? What was his ministry model? What was the plan to reach the world with the message of the gospel? It's really, really simple. He picked 12 guys who were ordinary guys. He poured his life into them. He trained them. He equipped them. And then he let go of them. Empowered with the Holy Spirit. Empowered with the resurrection. And I don't know if you've noticed, but those guys did change the world. And so we began to ask ourselves, okay, what do we do? All right, because this idea of just kind of reaching a certain number of people and building buildings and stuff, it's not really working on a national scale, so what do we do? I thought about just kind of blowing up the whole thing, dismantling the whole church, ask my, my team, I, I do that about once a year. Anybody like that that you just fantasize about, man, I'm going to dismantle this thing. Whenever the consumeristic temperature of my church starts rising, I just have, I lay awake at night and I fantasize about just blowing the whole thing up. I mean, not like physically blowing it up, but like dismantling, just, just like going Francis Chan on my church, just, just dismantling that thing. I love Francis, but anyway, I'm just saying, I, I dream about that kind of stuff. But then here's the question, and I want you to ask yourself this question. We began to ask this. Is it possible to do both? That's a great question. If you're thinking about planting an attractional model church or if you're doing that, you need to be asking yourself this question. Is it possible to do both? Is it possible to attract people by the dozens and the hundreds and the thousands and also to release people by the dozens and the hundreds and the thousands? We came to the conclusion that it is possible to do both. It's possible to have a big fat and right in the middle. of attractional and incarnational, attractional and missional. We call it missional communities. That's the venue. You guys kind of got your mind around probably what missional communities are by this point. I want to tell you um, kind of how, three things, how we've made this transition, then I'm going to be done. How we've made this transition into missional communities, giving people the shot to live on mission for God. We began to think, what if we challenged and we trained and we equipped our small group leaders who would then uh, turn and turn train and challenge and equip our small groups not just to, not just to come together on a Tuesday night and eat some snacks, uh, you know, some chips and dips and have a Bible study and pray and go home. But we thought, what if we trained these people? What if, we, what if we equipped them? What if we challenged them and released them to actually come together with the purpose of being the church? These small groups, what if we took our small group ministry and challenged them and trained them to come together uh, for the purpose of living incarnationally and missionally, to challenge them to come together as a group and in their neighborhood, in their workplaces, in their campuses, to live on mission for God as the church? Could we make a difference? And I think the answer is yes. We're seeing it happen in Austin. It's slow, but we're seeing it happen. Here's how we're doing it. Number one, we changed the definition of success for our small group ministry. It's key. We changed the definition of success. All, that our, all of our small group leaders who used to just come and think, okay, if I, gather in the, if I gather in a group of people from the main service and we're hanging out together and we're having a Bible study and we're eating chips and dips and we're loving on each other, then that's success. And we said, no, those things are good and we want you to continue to do those things, but we want to change your definition of success your definition of success, small group leader, now is not are you gathering 12 people, 10 people, and having a Bible study, but are, are you doing that, and then are you moving beyond that, and choosing and finding a pocket of lostness or need in the city of Austin, and, or, or the University of Texas, and engaging that lostness, engaging that need for the glory of God in the name of Christ with the gospel. That now is our definition of success. Not are you meeting, but have you moved beyond that and are engaging in the mission of God together. 
That's, that, that's now our definition of success. And so maybe you ask, well, Matt, okay, th- these missional communities who, who have now just, the definition is not just to get together and hang out, but, but be on mission together, are they finding community? Are they at, because that's kind of part of the goal, is we're going to find community, right? Has this made us lose community? Well, I want to propose to you that there is no greater way for a group of people to foster community than be on mission together. I mean, how many of you guys were youth pastors? Have a lock-in with a group of 30 kids and then take that same group of 30 kids the next week on a mission trip. What's going to foster a greater sense of community? All right, here's what we found at the Austin Stone. That when we were aiming for community, we got neither community nor mission. But when we aim for mission, we got both mission and community. All right, here's the thing, second thing. Here's what we did. I'm going to do this one really fast and get to the last one, land the plane. Number two, you got to train your small group leaders like you would train a missionary. You can't train them like a Bible study leader. A typical American Christian who sat in a typical American church, they can lead a Bible study, but that's not the goal. The goal is to be on mission. And so you've got to train them like missionaries. You've got to train them to be able to feed themselves. If if the primary source of what they're learning from the Lord is is, is coming through some other person and not through the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, I I think that's, that's a problem When you go to Sudan and you're a missionary, you better better be able to feed yourself. And so we train them like missionaries. We teach those guys every single thing we know. We train them uh, theologically. We give them everything we've got. We give them access to everything we got. We train them theologically, missionally, missional practice. We want them, the the, the small group leader, the missional community group leader, we, we want them to be so well trained and so equipped that if God calls them to leave and be their own church, that they're equipped and trained to do that and to lead that church. And many of them have. And we applaud it. Last thing. Last thing. And this is this is massive. Is we have raised the bar. We have raised the bar for what it looks like, for what our missional community groups are engaging in. We have just raised the bar and said, guys, what you guys can do as a group, the mission you can engage in, we want you to know that the sky is the limit. Exponential, you need to know that your people are capable of more than you've ever dreamed they are capable of. The people that God will bring you, I don't know if you think about this, I think sometimes as pastors we forget this, but the people that God brings us that are saved, they have the power of the resurrection inside them. The power that raised Jesus from the grave is passing out your bulletins. And you got to realize that. you got to get to the place where you release some guy named Al Lopez. Al was a VP at Dell in Austin, was living the American dream, had a paid off, very expensive house in the best part of Austin, and he heard our, our, our series that we did on being a church for our city and, and the call to, to be ministers for the gospel and that we're all missionaries, and, and he heard that call. He sold his house. This is a VP at Dell. He sold his house. He moved into the poorest neighborhood in the city of Austin, the most under-resourced neighborhood, period, in the city of Austin. Bought a couple of houses, three houses next to each other, fixed them up, and now has formed a missional community. And he and his wife are loving on and discipling and, and training single moms, allowing them to live in affordable housing and be trained for for jobs and Al Lopez, this guy that was a VP of Dell, is just giving his life away for the cause and the name of the purpose and the glory of Jesus Christ. And man, he is making such a difference in the city. This just normal guy is making such a difference in the neighborhood. And, and here's the thing, here's the thing. If we had never challenged him, I want you to think about the people in your church. 
If we had never challenged him, if we had never raised the bar on what we believed God could do through him, and if we had never released him, if we'd never given him permission to use his finances and his time and his gifting outside of our four walls, then there is a good chance that Al Lopez spends the rest of his life sitting in the seats of our sanctuary, listening to me preach, listening to us sing songs, maybe passing the offering plate, and he dies and goes straight to heaven, never knowing the thrill of what it feels like to get in the fight. Never knowing the thrill of what it's like for God to reach down and say, I'm going to pick and use you for the glory of my name. Your people are more hungry than you, than you and I know and have ever dreamed of to be used by God. Challenge them, train them, release them to give their lives away, not just to come to church but to be the church. Let's pray. Father, we love you. God, there is not a man or a woman in this room that doesn't struggle with the idol of approval and power and control. and Help us to put you on the throne of our hearts so that we would be people that worship you and pursue you and give our lives to you. And God, you are worth it. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.